Thank you for the opportunity of presenting this work on history of first human heart transplant. It has brought back many happy memories and interesting facts in looking up the background to this. I sometimes feel like Spike Milligan, having been in the trenches when all this happens, but probably I was a little closer to the action than Spike Milligan was to Montgomery in the Second World War. Heart interventions have been a, a controversial topic right through history. We've all known the essential factor of life being a heartbeat. Heart and soul have been linked. As recently as the last decade, I was at a family reunion in Switzerland when one of my relatives, by marriage I should add, came to me and said, aren't you people worried about doing heart transplant because the soul of the person is in the heart? You're going to get these people confused. And in primitive cultures, and as we'll see cultures today, this is still very relevant. When Ludwig Rhein in Germany first introduced a catheter into his cephalic vein and up into his heart, People regard that with horror and revulsion. He was really put aside by the medical profession. How could you do something so dangerous, so unethical? But he did it on himself. So he just persisted. And in fact, it was just some years later, in fact, many 30 years later, that the Americans, uh, Cournot and Richards, actually Cournot is French-American, developed uh, cardiac catheterization, which we now know is a common topic for which many of you listening to this presentation will have benefited. These three were together given the Nobel Prize for their work. But entering the sacred organ is another matter. Back in 1914, Tufier in France did a, an aortic valve dilatation. So technically, he would have put his finger in the aortic valve and entered the sacred organ. And then in 1923, Elliot Luther did mitral valve dilatation, where he could enter the heart and put his fingers in the constricted mitral valve and force it open. And mitral valvotomy was a common operation even when I was a houseman and registrar. But it was back in 1953 that John Gibbon in Philadelphia developed the heart-lung machine. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you see here Gibbon with his original machine and the color picture here, the uh, modern theater scene for a modern heart-lung machine. And this has enabled bypassing heart and lungs and uh, modern surgery to occur. Now, why does this technology related to heart surgery come back to a place like Cape Town? at the tip end of Africa, which some people have labeled the gangrenous tip of Africa, why should it have gone there? Well, perhaps we can go back to Professor Robert Goetz, who was born in Germany and went to medical school in those tumultuous years in Germany, 1929 to 35. And as a medical student, he was forced to join the Nazi party. And being a member of the party, you had to do due diligence and you were given a book. And in that book, you had to write in all the demonstrations you attended, etc. And well, Goetz didn't really like the Nazi party. He was forced to join. He wasn't very good attending meetings or recording it. So when he graduated at his university, cum laude, I may add, 
1936, the Minister of the Interior said, nein, he's not going to graduate from Germany. He's an unreliable person. He may not graduate in Germany. So Goetz knew that some of his professors had already left the country, and he joined one of these people in Bern, Switzerland, where he was readily given a job because he was known as a very good medical student. But he looked over his shoulder a bit, and Bern was a little close to Germany, and he thought, well, if Hitler gets his way, and Switzerland's overrun, what's going to happen to me? So he went to Edinburgh. And in Edinburgh, he joined a research team where he was involved in looking at the placental circulation of lemurs, something that was right up his alley. He was keen on circulatory research, but he was not Jewish, so he could not apply for uh, immigrant status there. Being a German, he was suspect. He could only get a one-year visa. At that time, the professor of surgery in Cape Town was a chap called Charlie Saint, an Englishman, and he uh, had treated a wealthy businessman called J.S. Marais, who gave a substantial sum of money for medical research. And this job was advertised that here's some money available for medical research in Cape Town. And Goetz thought, well, that's a nice long way away from Europe. I think I'll go there. So he got married, his wife was a doctor, and his wife was his assistant. And there he furthered his interest in cardiovascular research. And one of the things that had fascinated him is that the giraffe, you've often seen pictures of giraffe drinking. They put their legs out like that. They put their long neck in the water and drink, and then put their head up again. And Goethe argued that if you and I had a neck that long and did that, we'd fall over because our brain would not be able to keep up with the blood supply when we went from that position to that position. So he thought he'd look into that. And he discovered that there were valves in the giraffe's neck that permitted that to happen. But for him to do that work, he needed some assistance. And it was there that he employed a chap, which you can see the bottom right in the picture, called uh, Hamilton Naki, and a group of people who helped him with the research. And Hamilton Naki was a sturdy African who had been a gardener there, and he thought, well, he's just the kind of guy who I need to help with the uh, giraffe research. So he employed Hamilton. After the war, he got a little bit restless and thought it was time for him to move on. He was offered the job of Professor of Physiology in Pretoria, but he soon discovered that Pretoria was a hotbed of Nazism at the time, so he thought, no, I'm going to the USA, which he did. And he became a distinguished researcher in uh, New York, where he was the person who established coronary artery bypass grafting. And that is quite an amazing uh, course for him. So we come to Hamilton Naki, his assistant. And I knew Hamilton very well. I worked in the Moray Laboratory uh, during my research time in Cape Town. Well, Hamilton was born in the Transkei, went to minimal age at school, and uh, went down to Langa in Cape Town, a black area, to uh, gain his fame and fortune. He was employed as a gardener at the university and seconded to the medical school campus, 
at Schroeder's Cure. As I mentioned, there he assisted Robert Goetz. And uh, when Goetz went to the States, he stayed on. And it was at that time that the new lab was commissioned and he was appointed lab assistant. It was there that he started his association with Chris Barnard when Chris Barnard came back from the USA. And uh, you'll note the overlap with he, Goetz's work in the uh, center of the Lima. He worked with dog fetus and dog placenta, and then they moved on from there to heart, liver, and I was involved with him in the gastrointestinal research. Hamilton rose through the ranks. He started doing minor surgery in the lab, and he became very adept. He and his team, uh, the professor of surgery in Cape Town, Yanni Lowe, went as far as saying that if he needed a very meticulous anastomosis done, he would get one of those guys to do it because they were doing quarter cable shunts in the rat. And for those of you who've seen vasculature in the rat to join two vessels together, that is quite something. And Hamilton was very good. And he assisted Barnard and was involved in quite a bit of the work there. There are many folk tales about Hamilton and the first heart transplant. In some of the more dramatic uh, ragtime newspaper uh, events, it was said that Hamilton actually did the first transplant, but that is not true. Uh, Hamilton uh, was involved in the work, but he had no part in the actual operation of the first transplant. I must say, to the credit of Chris Barnard, he was recognized as having contributed significantly and was given an honorary MSc, the first person in his family to have a university degree. And here in the bottom picture, you see him being recognized by the then uh, president of South Africa, Mbeki. The next person I wish to acknowledge as a significant contributor to the heart transplant is Prof. Valva Shreera. Val Shreera and my American mentor during my fellowship there are the two probably most influential people in my academic life. He was a wonderful teacher. He uh, did his MBCHB in Cape Town, PhD in physiology, and as many South Africans at the time, went to London to do his postgraduate training, where he studied with Paul, Wool, Paul Wood, the National Heart Hospital, and came back to Cape Town in 1951, where he established the Hrutskill Hospital Cardiac Clinic. That was a remarkable clinic with the records and the investigation of patients second to none. Shreera was a master at uh, academic records. He was an inspiring leader, teacher, author, prodigious memory. He was really a man of stature and integrity. And he was really the brains behind let's say, the inventive genius and craziness of Barnard. And working as uh, Shreera's registrar uh, after the transplant, he used to come mumbling about this cardiac surgeon of his who doesn't read the literature and expect him to keep up with the literature to tell him, no, you, that won't work, you can't do that. Now we come to the next person who is really... I don't know whether to call him a villain or a hero, but he did achieve quite remarkable things. He, he's, he was a character, and as you can see here, very pleasant, outgoing kind of guy. He was born in Beaufort West, in the middle of nowhere in South Africa. The Karoo is a semi-desert. His father was a Dutch Reformed Church minister, 
And in that community, they are really very uh, respected, elevated members of society. He was one of five children. His brother Marius was also a doctor. And Marius was my registrar when I was a surgical houseman. So I got to know Marius Barnard uh, very well. Chris Barnard graduated in 1945 and went to work as a country GP. He returned as a medical registrar in 1951 and in 1953 handed in an MD thesis which had followed the progress of 259 patients with tuberculous meningitis. Quite a remarkable work. He was no slouch. He then became interested in surgery, was employed in the Murray Laboratory and worked with Hamilton, where he worked on intestinal atresia in dogs. And while he was there, the American surgeon Wangenstein, many of you older people who are listening to this talk will remember the old drip and suck Wangenstein drip named after Wangenstein. And uh, Wangenstein was visiting Cape Town and he'd come across a good Cape Town graduate in the state somewhere. And he spoke to Professor Brock, who was actually the physician, said, well, do you have somebody else who could come across and help us? And Brock said, yes, yeah, somebody who's in your field in surgery. This chap Barnard's pretty good. Why don't you give him a job? So he did. And in 1955, Barnard went across to Angenstein in Minnesota, where he continued his intestinal research in dogs, didn't waste his time. In 1958, he did a PhD on intestinal atresia in dogs, showing that if you interrupt the blood supply of the gut intrauterine, while the bitch is still pregnant, it will lead to the human picture of Hirschsprung's disease. So uh, that was quite a remarkable finding. And while there, he met Lily High, the cardiothoracic surgeon, and Vince Gott in Minnesota. And Gott was developing the heart-lung machine and expanding its capability. And this really captured Barnard. He spoke to Wagenstein and transferred from gastrointestinal surgery to cardiac surgery. And it was there that he met Norman Shumway, this at the bottom right over there. While there, didn't waste his time, did an MSc for his work on prosthetic aortic valve. He returned to Cape Town in 1958, and this was when I was a second year medical student. We met him in 1960 when he lectured in uh, surgical pathology and then in our clinical years as a tutor. And I tell you, he was some tutor. You didn't dare forget what he told you. Otherwise, he'd kill you. And he was really one of these guys that was really quite something. Anyhow, he was appointed head of experimental surgery. Besides his research, he was also an active clinician, did operation lists, saw outpatients, and as I've mentioned, he was a fearful teacher, but very effective. He developed an international profile, and uh, despite South Africa at the time being isolated, and in South Africa, anything that was directed against the government was Suppression of Communism Act, you could be had up for. But... Barnard, being the person he was and presenting the profile of South Africa, he had carte blanche to do anything he liked, and he could go to Moscow and back, and the government would have, would protect him. And he set up a relationship with, with Vladimir uh, Demikov. And uh, I remember his coming back to uh, lecture theatre sessions 
giving talks about his experience in Russia, including the heavy drinking of the uh, uh, Russian surgeons before surgery. It, they were all very interesting talks. He was very close to Demikov, apparently. He also kept tabs with Shumway at Stanford so that he was up to date with what was happening in the transplant world. In the meantime, he was progressing his own transplant research in the Moray lab in association uh, with Hamilton Naki. At this point, I'll just take a little diversion of script to say just a little bit about Chris Barnard. And as you can judge from what I've said, a controversial character, but a bright guy and really pleasant in many ways. I could regale you for 24 hours about stories repeated over the table at the doctor's bungalow at lunch about Barnard. I mean, just some of them were just incredible. I'll just give you two to give different aspects of Barnard. He used to come around the ward before he was famous, hair all over the place, a brown jacket with leather patches on his sleeves, baggy fawn pants, and he'd walk around the ward and uh, he went into one ward where a new houseman was trying to put in a drip in a patient and having difficulty to get the needle in the vein. And Chris Barnard came and said, oh, let me do that, you know. And the patient looked at him and he said, oh, don't worry, I'm a porter. I've seen this done many times. And he put it in and walked off. So that, that was the one side of Chris Barnard. The other side of Chris Barnard, when we were housemen, my co-houseman, Willem Lubber, who some of you might uh, know, who became Professor of Experimental Surgery in uh, Cardiac Surgery in Auckland. So this uh, little episode didn't put him off academic medicine. <clears throat> but Willem and I were housemen together, and I was very relieved that it happened to Willem and not to me. Anyhow, uh, one of Chris Barnard's patients was in the ward, She'd had a mitral valvotomy, and she was she had atrial fibrillation, was put on warfarin, which was the only anticoagulant available at that time, and she was admitted to a medical ward because she had bleeding. I forget where, actually, she had been bleeding, but it was a significant bleed. She was admitted to the, to the ward. Now, what do you do with someone? Feeding on warfarin, you give them vitamin K to reverse warfarin. So, yep. So, Willem gave that and everything fine. Barnard comes around the ward round to see his patients and he looks at the drug chart. Who wrote that? Willem, I did so. You gave her vitamin K? Yes, sir. And he picked Willem up. Willem was a bit bigger than me. Picked him up and put him up against the wall. You do not give people with atrial fibrillation <laughs> vitamin K. You give them fresh and plasma. Never forget that. <laughs> he dropped Willem. So that was the, the type of reaction you had. So he was really... Quite a character, very well known. Anyhow, Vladimir Demikov, Barnard's friend, is of pe peasant origin, or was of peasant origin, inspired by Pavlov in Russia, and worked as in research as an undergraduate, and created an artificial dog heart as a student. So he was quite a guy. Graduated with honors from Moscow University in 1940, but being war years, he was conscripted to the army. Post-war, he did physiology at the Moscow State University, then took a job at the Institute of Surgical Studies. And it was there that he worked 
on liver and kidney transplant. He also did heart transplants, 1951. Orthotopic heart transplant, one dog surviving seven years. So that was uh, uh, very well uh, done for him. In 1954, he deviated into creating two-headed dogs. And Barnard got onto that as well and did that in Cape Town. And it was just awful. I, I purposely did not put any photographs here of those because I think a lot of you, and I certainly was offended by looking at those photographs. And and for what? I mean, just to show that it could be done. But he did a lot of uh, experimental transplant work and his thesis on experimental transplantation was translated into many languages and became the uh, reference work for transplantation. Well, where do heart transplants actually hit the road? James Hardy was a surgeon in Jax, a nurse, a and uh, he was the first person to do a lung transplant, uh, which wasn't very successful. But again, in those days, immunology was very, very basic to say the least. Back in 1964, that's quite a few years before Barnard's work, he had a deaf mute patient brought into his ward with a poor heartbeat. And he thought, well, it might be the opportunity of doing a heart transplant on this chap if his heart doesn't survive. So he had this patient's stepsister sign a consent for heart transplant, which he did. The donor that he had, had a heart that continued beating and continued beating and continued beating. And he lived long enough with a beating heart that the heart was no longer suitable for transplant. But Hardy had something else up his sleeve. He had four chimps standing by and thought, well, this <laughs> sounds like really deep sound medicine. <laughs> I hope I'm not offending anybody. Uh, and we'll put a chimp into this chap. So he put a chimp heart into this patient. Now, remember this in the newspapers. And uh, it didn't last very long because the chimp heart is very much smaller than the human heart and could not deal with the volume. So that was not a success. After the operation, all hell broke loose because the press got hold of the fact that chimps were uh, used and that the patient's stepsister had not specifically uh, uh, given consent for chimp heart to be used. But she didn't argue. You see, that's fine. I mean, he was a goner anyhow, so nobody lost. Adrian Kantrowitz was one of the big American pioneers for heart transplant. In 1955, he was director of cardiovascular surgery at Maimonides, New York. And his big interest was in left ventricular assistance for those in left ventricular failure. And he looked at creating mechanical hearts. And I remember at that time, Barnard giving a lot of talks about that, that mechanical hearts were fine to get a patient one or two days, three days perhaps, between a crisis to somewhere else. But you can't be discharged with a mechanical heart. It's just not practical. Uh, Kantrowitz did research on dogs and very successful research. Over 400 dogs, they survived for a year. So he was no slouch as a surgeon. But dog immunology is very different from human immun immunology. Dogs, you can transplant blood, etc. They just tolerate that very well. 
back in 1966, that is a year before Barnard, he had a patient with severe congenital heart disease and an anencephalic potential donor. And an anencephalic child is born without a brain. There is no hope that that child will live. And the parents gave consent. But in those days, if the heart was still beating, the patient was still alive. So they waited and waited and waited. And by the time the heart stopped, it wasn't suitable for transplant, so that was abandoned. Shumway moved on from Wangenstein and Lily High to Stanford, where he spent the rest of his career. And he really probably is one of the heroes of the whole piece. He did a lot of transplantation work with dogs working with Lower, who later moved to Virginia. And again, hundreds of dogs who survived very well indeed. Barnard kept touch with him, keeping up with the techniques of transplant surgery. Note the date, 20th November, 1967, Shumway announced from Stanford, we are ready to do the world's first heart transplant. Well, that gave a stimulus to Chris Barnard. And he had a patient in Crucio Hospital called Louis Wyskansky, 55-year-old Lithuanian Jewish grocer, immigrated to South Africa many years before, renowned sportsman. He was not the ideal candidate for surgery, diabetic. He'd had three myocardial infarcts. He was in tractable cardiac failure and really didn't face much of a future. Val Schreerer fully investigated him and said, well, if he could get a new heart, he'd have a hope. So when they discussed this with Washkansky, Chris Barnard said to Washkansky, well, Washkansky asked him, what, what, what chance do I have of success? So Barnard said, 80%. And I could just imagine Shreera saying, <laughs> do you really mean that? But anyhow, uh, <laughs> Barnard, in discussing that, said, well, if... If you have a, a lion chasing you and you're running, you're running away from the lion and the lion is catching up on you and you come to a river and the river's full of crocodiles, are you going to swim across the river? Of course you're going to swim across the river. You have 80% chance of getting across. And that, that's what he put to Washkansky. Now, what was Barnard's background at the time with heart transplanting dogs? He'd done successful heart transplants in 49 dogs, but the experiments were stopped quite soon afterwards, so his long-term survival wasn't really well known. And the day after Shumway made his announcement from Stanford, 21st of November, Barnard announced, we're also ready, it's a race. He had a young black accident victim as a potential donor for a heart recipient. Washkansi was ready, was shaved and prepped for the operation. But again, they waited for that heart to stop and it didn't, so that had to be cancelled. Barnard was really very anxious to be the first. And then came Denise Darvel. I was the medical registrar on, for medical casualty on that day, and we heard of this young woman coming through, and uh, she had been involved in a severe motor accident that afternoon crossing the road. She and her mother went to buy some cake at the baker. They were going visiting friends. 
Her mother was killed. She was very seriously injured. Anne Washkansky, uh, Washkansky's wife, saw the accident coming back from visiting her husband. And every time she saw an accident, she thought, is this perhaps the donor? This time it was. Anyhow, Denise was admitted to a pre-prepared ward. The registrar phoned Chris Barnard, said he thinks we've got a suitable donor. And the registrar commented on a strange comment. He asked, is she colored? And uh, the registrar said, no, why? Chris Barnard did not, not answer. And it will become later, clear to you later why he asked. That evening, Denise's father gave consent. And it set up a, a really interesting uh, scenario. Well, what do you want for an ideal donor? A young, well, healthy cardiovascular system. A white person is preferable in South Africa of that day. Because if you took the heart of a black person and put it in a white person, politically, that might create havoc. And as we saw later, that was probably true. So having a white person to a white patient, that was some stupid things white people do. It was not using black people as a source of donor. So Denise Darwell was pretty good for that. The recipient, well, Chris Barnard thought the best recipient would be a fit young black man with cardiomyopathy. In other words, a pathology that just involved the heart and the rest of the body being absolutely fine. And uh, that having a white heart save a black person would probably be politically excusable. But Louis Wyszkanski was not that. And the 80% chance of success was really pushing it a lot. And I think it's important that the definition of death at this stage was not what we know today. And a heartbeat means that you're not dead. And Val Schreer was very concerned that if they took Denise Darvel's heart before her heart stopped, what killed her? The accident or taking the heart out? Anyhow, the time came when they had to decide. At nine o'clock that evening, she was declared brain dead. And they did that with the usual reflexes through the ear and balance, etc. And they had a team of 30 people ready to go. Chris Barnard had the theatrics all, all mapped out. And we got some of this background from the telephonists. I mean, telephonists in hospitals are amazing people. They know everything of what goes on. And the telephonist said, really midnight. And he got a message to phone Dr. Benny Shapiro and tell him to come to a medical history session. <laughs> and in the middle of the night, Benny Shapiro was the physician who had been looking after uh, Washkansky. And uh, Barnard thought it courteous that he be notified. Uh, so everybody that was needed to be there was there. Chris Barnard was really impatient to start the operation, but that heart kept on beating. How long do they wait? And it was only reported, it wasn't reported initially, it was only reported about 40 years later that Marius Barnard said to him, how about if we give potassium chloride intravenously? And 
medical people will know if you give potassium chloride intravenously, the heart goes and stops. And I thought, well, that sounds a little bit dramatic. And how did they know it would start again? And I inquired through some of our anesthetic friends here that this is in fact quite possible. And they do that regularly now, I mean, using potassium to stop the heart and then restart it. So they slipped her some IV potassium chloride and sure enough, the heart stopped. They were off. So Washkansi was anesthetized. Chris and Marius Barnard worked on the recipient, Washkansky, and Rod Hewitson, uh, a personal friend of mine, actually, wonderful guy, uh, did the harvesting of the heart from uh, Denise Starvel. Just before six o'clock, transplant was completed. They started weaning off the heart-lung machine, but initially the heart just gave a few little beats and the blood pressure wasn't up to much. So they cut back the machine a little bit and then they restarted again just after six o'clock. Marius Barnard, the first time when it started, said, God, Vask, it's going to work. And then at quarter past six, the heart beat properly, the blood pressure was there, and dit het gewerk. it did work. This is the heart transplant team. See Chris Barnard there, Val Schreer, an extreme with his hair sticking up. And the little picture on the side is Barnard looking very dapper and Rod Hewitson uh, next to him. After the transplant, you would not believe the response. It was like an electric storm. International media. Krutzke Hospital, the whole front of the hospital had to be sealed off. CNN, CBS, BBC, all the European channels were just crawling all over the place. Uh, the international visitors that came all over. I mean, down the passages of Fort Skure, I saw Barnard entertaining uh, Peter Sellers, uh, Evelda Marcos. <laughs> you know, they all they came. They wanted to see when it happened. And particularly the the uh, Latin Europeans, I mean, the Spaniards, Italians, French, just went absolutely crazy. And the transplant unit they came to see on the day, <laughs> there wasn't one. There was a passage with a few rooms for the transplant, and literally one of those curtain things that you open out, blocking off the passage in between. And I remember somebody asking, where's the immunology unit? There wasn't one. And uh, Bertie Bossman, who was the cardiothoracic, one of the cardiothoracic registrars, uh, had expert knowledge in immunology, but uh, it, it wasn't really uh, at a very high level. And Wyszkanski lived for 18 days, which was a success from the operation point of view, it could be done, but he was not a long-term survival. The second patient didn't do too well either. And the third patient, uh, Phil Bleiberg, a dentist, lived for 19 and a half months. And he was dragged out to all kinds of meetings, etc., to uh, show what heart transplant can do. The publicity machine, as you can imagine, did something quite remarkable, both for Barnard, for Kritzky Hospital. So it was, it was a, 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 quite an achievement. The effect on the local populace that I hinted at earlier was quite something too, because a lot of the black and colored population were absolutely horrified of this and were terrified of coming to the hospital. I remember it was another unit completely had nothing to do with cardiothoracic surgery. 
the professorial firm looking there, uh, well, let, let's say it was uh, liver disease, had Prof A and Prof B, and uh, this patient had been given an appointment for such and such a day to attend the clinic of Prof B, and he didn't turn up. So when it was chased up afterwards and found the patient, Prof B, you think I'm stupid? He's looking, i got nothing to do with hearts. He was just I was going to be referred to Prof B in case I was suitable for a donor somewhere. So people were very conscious of that. So what were the sequelae to the transplant? Well, Barnard took on the playboy life. He loved it. He really, he was really suave. And the picture here, yes, that is Princess Di is having meals with. He really lived the high life. And in the year after the, uh, well, months after the uh, transplant, he visited uh, Rome, where I'm sure he was entertained rather differently between Pope Paul and Gina Lola Brigida where in his autobiography he describes a one-night stand and a session with Sophia Loren. He continued his work on uh, heart transplants, doing 10 at Rescure, four lived for over 18 months, one lived 24 years. So it offered these patients something. From 1974 onwards, he used the piggyback transplant method where he left some of the left ventricle that had been damaged behind and tried to keep what was good and then grafted onto that the donor left ventricle. And he had quite good success with that, 60% living over one year and 36% five-year survival. So that wasn't bad. In 1983, he retired because of rheumatoid arthritis and then got involved with aging research in Switzerland with, with skin care and they treated rich and famous patients. So it was quite a career. He had three marriages. His, when his first marriage ended, it was reported in that distinguished British um, publication, Private Eye, and his picture on the front cover with a little bubble coming out saying, Barnard divorces because he keeps on putting organs into other people. And uh, he, his second wife was actually introduced to him by my boss, Sully Marks. And Sully came in giggling one day and he said, you know, something's going to happen here. I introduced Chris Barnard to this gorgeous young woman. And he said, you could see him. He was just struck. And in fact, he buried her, Barbara Zulna, and she was the same age as his children. That lasted a few years. And his third marriage was to someone who was the same age as his grandchildren. So he, 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 he lived quite a high life. He spent a few years in Oklahoma, and then after that, mostly splitting his time between Austria and a game farm, which he established close to Beaufort West, where he was born. He did form the Chris Barnard Foundation, which helped needy children. So he did some good work there and died in Cyprus. It sounded as if he'd had a myocardial infarct, but apparently the autopsy showed asthma. What about Demikov? Some of these other people who were involved in the transplant work. Well, he established lots of links with people from the West when he was at the Sklisovsky Institute of Emergency Medicine and did a lot to gain acceptance of transplantation amongst humans. 
However, there was no record of any heart transplant from his unit or any other human transplant from his unit. And it's a bit strange because I'm sure someone like Stalin would have provided a whole queue of donors. Anyhow, uh, he was regarded by many as the father of heart and lung transplantation. But typical of Russia, I mean, talking about Dan by faint praise, just before his death, he was awarded Order of Merit for the Fatherland, third class. <laughs> so uh, that was rather sad. He died alone of a ruptured aneurysm in a small apartment in Moscow. Kantrowitz did the first transplant of an American person. Again, another an anencephalic infant donor to a child with severe congenital heart disease, but the child did not survive long. The second patient that he operated on did not survive very long, and he became unimpressed with cardiac transplant and turned his mind with his brother, who was a bioengineer, to his first love of machines to keep blood pressure going. And it's still being used today, the uh, left ventricular assists. And he had a big clash with the hospital administration in New York, and typical of management said, you know, you need more profitable research instead of much mucking around with these machines. So he took his whole team to Mount Sinai Hospital in Detroit, where he perfected these gadgets and achieved world fame with his left ventricular uh, assist device. He died of congestive cardiac failure. Shumway, who really is probably the one who shines brightest in this whole saga as a person, he did the second heart transplant. And shortly after the first few heart transplants, was taken to court by an upstart Californian lawyer. And that Californian lawyer found in the statutes that if you're going to use human body parts, you had to have an autopsy of the patient first. And this did not occur. And uh, Shamway said, well, if you're going to do that, forget about transplant. It's not going to happen. And to his credit, particularly for a cardiac surgeon, those who worked with him said that's the first time they ever heard Shumway raise his voice. And that was against the lawyer and not against his judges, as opposed to Barnard. I mean, I, I, as a houseman, I'd work, be assisting in the next lecture theatre and you'd hear these obscenities and stuff being thrown against the walls and things. But Shumway was a real gentleman. And he overcame the result, first poor results initially, by understanding the immunology. He studied the work of Medawa and others in immunology, did cardiac biopsies, to determine, is this, does this look as if the heart is rejecting? And really master that. So that in the end, you can see here, he was involved in 687 transplants, greater than 80% five-year survival rates. So he, it has, with his guidance, has become a really successful procedure. And Shumway is described as a man of dignity and excellence. He's also recorded as saying that he never liked Barnard, but he's very grateful to Barnard, <laughs> having spared him the trouble of dealing with the press. He wasn't after adulation, etc. He just wanted to get the work done. Now, I thought I'd just finish by just showing how does this affect New Zealand? And I... Uh, Acknowledge Tom Pasley and Helen Gibbs in Auckland for providing me with this data. And you can see here, I was 
pleasantly impressed as to how many transplants have been done in New Zealand between 87 and 2021. And if you look at this median survival rate of 14.9 years. So that is really good. So not only did heart transplant offer people with terminal cardiac failure an outlet, but it has promoted a good lifestyle for them. And in fact, on our holiday in the North Island last month, we met a donor, at least a recipient of heart transplant, who just like another person, had we not known she'd been a recipient, just living a normal life 10 years or so after her surgery. So we can be thankful for these pioneers who were out there and did funny things, crazy things, and sometimes horrible things, but it's a wonderful result. Thank you.